Hello and welcome to episode four of the Farm One podcast. I'm sitting here in Tribeca inside Farm One. I'm joined remotely from Maryland by Michael Chin. Hello, Michael. Hey, Rob. Hi, everyone. Hey, how you doing? Um, and it's just me here in the farm. You might have noticed very lonely here today. Uh, Ina is in Arizona, but it means uh, just boys today, boys time. We're going to have a bit of an industry uh, chat and we're going to go in detail into some stuff about startups and about the news and about vertical farming and about some of our experience as well. So it should be an interesting uh, time. But first of all, what I'm going to do is go into what's in this week's uh, farm share box. Okay, so if you don't know about Farm One, we're a farm that's based here in New York City. We've been here overall for about four years, but in Tribeca just for three years. And I'm sitting in a farm, uh, which is a vertical farm. You'll see all these stacked layers behind me. You'll see hydroponics. You can probably hear a little bit of hydroponics as well. Um, and what we do is we grow a very wide range of baby greens, microgreens, edible flowers and herbs. Uh, and we've been doing that for a long time for chefs and restaurants in the city. Uh, but what we do now is that we actually deliver these products to consumers every week. So we have a membership. Uh, where our members can get a weekly delivery of these fresh greens. Uh, and it's pretty exciting. We launched it pretty recently. We've got some very, very happy customers with it. And I'm going to show you a little bit about what you get uh, in the box. And every week that box will change. So you'll get different access to herbs, uh, baby greens, microgreens, and it varies all the time. Uh, we always try to get feedback from our customers as well because we want to give them uh, exactly what they want. And after it's harvested, it's going to be delivered same day, really just within a few hours, sometimes a few minutes of like when it's harvested. So you can't really get a fresher product on the market. Remember, if you go to the grocery store, for instance, that product will be sitting there normally for days uh, before it, you'll get to it. Um, so this opportunity to get really, really fresh stuff is really fantastic. But enough of a sales pitch. Uh, I'm going to show you what's in the in the bag. So. Um, what you'll get if you're a Farm One member is you'll get a bag like this every week. The bag is a reusable bag. It's made out of an insulated material, so your greens arrive nice and fresh. Uh, and our delivery uh, courier, Amir, will drop this off uh, on a bike every, every time. So no emissions involved in the delivery. Uh, and then you'll see inside what you'll get is three containers. And these containers are really cool. So uh, just to explain a little bit about the containers, what they are is a, it's reusable, so it's this kind of really uh, sturdy, heavy-duty plastic. This is reused and returned to us at the end of each week. So we wash them in our commercial dishwasher, we sanitize them so they're sparkling fresh and clean. Uh, but it, what it means is no plastic waste, right? So uh, as a customer, instead of getting dozens and dozens of plastic clamshells each week, that really, really adds up. That plastic in the US especially is quite unlikely to end up being recycled, if, even if you try to do the right thing with it. Instead, what we've got is a reusable container. And this container, okay, it won't last forever, but when actually it does each reach the end of its life cycle after many years, it can be recycled into another high quality item as well. So it's a really good way to sort of support a circular economy. So um, let's look inside. So you'll notice that we've got colors on the boxes, right? So uh, this is the blue box. You get one of, this is th one of three boxes that you get each week. And the blue box is full of herbs and flowers. So let's have a look what's in here. And Justin, our farm manager, our operations director, has made some nice notes for me up against the wall as well. So I can kind of see and remind myself, oh yeah, this is really, really cool. So uh, what we've got, look at those colors in there. Nice, huh? So we've got this guy. And this is a really cool one. Uh, this is something called Britain Shiso. So if you're familiar with um, Shiso, let me show you on the camera there. Yeah, so Shiso you'll have had uh, probably at a Japanese restaurant. That's where typically it might be found. Um, often with sushi, you can sort of wrap things in this fragrant leaf as well. Uh, this is a Britain Shiso and it's characteristic because you'll see the color on the underside. It's like this dark sort of really nice red actually. And you've got some sort of gradiated uh, color here as well. And it's similar in taste to a green shiso, um, but you know, sometimes just a little bit different in flavor, but also like that amazing uh, vibrant color as well. And with this, you could do a lot of things. There's a lot of shiso cocktails out actually out there. If you search for something like shiso yuzu um, or like a shiso, you could even do like a martini and sort of tear this as you make it and uh, get that really nice fragrance on there, but also a lot of Japanese dishes as well. 
Uh, if you become a member, what you do is get access as well to a bunch of recipes and a, a bunch of other content that shows you what to do with this stuff uh, as you order. So very, very cool. So that's uh, Britain Shiso. We've also got uh, a scattering of these Dianthus flowers, which are really, really pretty. They work great uh, getting cocktails, but also I made some uh, granola on the weekend uh, for me and my girlfriend and actually just pop some little flowers in there as well. Really, really nice. What we do to separate these items as well um, is that we, it's hard to see in here, but basically within the container, uh, we use popcorn shoots to separate out the items. So instead of using like a plastic uh, divider or something like that, we've got these natural biodegradable, obviously, uh, and edible popcorn shoots, which is really cool. And then let's have a look. All right, the other main thing in here, and there's quite a lot of it, uh, is this blue spice basil uh, and blue spice basil is really fragrant it's got an amazing sort of sweet quality to it um it's you've had this right michael it's like a you you get this sort of vanilla berry sweet uh somewhat sort of almost like a dessert uh scent and aroma from this but also a bit of spice so if you eat this you'll get um a little bit of that it's sort of um maybe evocative of like a thai uh, kind of spice in there as well. It's really, really nice. Hard to explain until you've tried it. But also we've got these, which are really precious. These are the flowers of the blue spice basil. And I can really just smell this literally by opening it up and just and just moving it, you can smell this. These are so beautiful. These little flowers have that aroma. Um, and for something like this, you know, a lot of people, a lot of home cooks have maybe never even used flowers before, right? So what do you do with these? And really what I normally say is you just, you can make almost any dish more special just by popping a few flowers on. And the advantage of flowers like this, like this blue spice basil, is that it has aroma as well, it has taste. And so for instance, let's say you were doing even a simple, uh, like a Thai curry or something like that. You might pop these little flowers just on top of the rice that you've got next to the curry and it's gonna give that rice a fragrance that you wouldn't get anywhere else. Or even if you wanted to do Oh, something like, you know, something really simple, like a very common dish, like a fried rice, but pop a few of these flowers on as you're serving it. And it's gonna give you that fragrance without having to use even very much product at all. It's really, really nice. So by getting access to this box, you're sort of getting some of the tools that chefs have and chefs are used to getting, but you can't find them in the supermarket. And especially you can't find them super fresh. So. Normally, if you're coming across, you know, fresh flowers for edible flowers in New York City, they're getting flown in from California. Um, you know, nothing wrong with California, but it's a long way away. And, you know, if you think about water use as well, one of the nice things about hydroponic farming is that uh, these farms really don't use very much water. But also we're in a state, New York, that actually has plenty of water. And so we're using New York water. We're not using California water, uh, which is severely, severely in trouble right now. Obviously, you know about the droughts. Um, and fires and things like that. So just another reason why that's that's pretty exciting. So that's your herbs and flowers box, uh, the blue box in there. Let's have a look at the yellow one. So Rob, if if you're yep. sort of you know a HelloFresh or one of these meal kit customers, um, how would you how would you go about experimenting with some of this? Because you know I, there there's sort of a, a few schools of thought, right? You've got people that are uh, tight recipe followers. Um, but then there are those that, you know, just throw stuff in and see what happens when it comes out. How, how, how did yeah. you learn? <laughs> um, you know, I've had a sort of evolving relationship with food. You know, when I, um, when I was growing up, you know, my mom was a really good cook. But I think as, as a family in the UK, which might be a common experience of, of a lot of American families as well, was, you know, in the 80s, we didn't really know that many other cuisines. We really didn't know that many different uh, ingredients. We certainly didn't go to fancy restaurants very often or if at all. Um, you know, I remember living in Surrey in the UK, you know, at the age of uh, whatever, 10, 11. Um, and this is sort of 1991 or so. You know, a Thai restaurant was like an exotic thing that nobody really knew what that was, you know. And this is speaking as a family where we had traveled a fair bit. You know, we lived in Australia. We had traveled through Singapore and we'd been through, um, you know, a bunch of different countries. But that familiarity with kind of foreign food was not there. Right. And so uh, contrast that to now, you know, if I go back to my parents place in Melbourne now, like, 
you know, it could be very, very normal for us to eat Vietnamese food for lunch and then go and eat, uh, at, you know, a restaurant that represents part of Africa, for instance, or something like that. So it's like, it's something that's really evolved. And personally, you know, I think one of the big learning experiences for me was going off to college and a, a good friend of mine who was my roommate, actually his, he was a, a Chinese uh, British guy uh, and, but from Manchester, so very contrasting accent to what you know you might expect. Um, but like his uh, family actually ran a Chinese restaurant, so he was the first person who was like my age who knew how to cook, knew how to like deep fry stuff as well, which was like super exciting. Um, but yeah, I sort of learned from that. But then you know gradually, gradually, I got really more and more into plant-based food and and cooking with fresh plant ingredients, and eventually took culinary classes through. Uh, Matthew Kenny's school in uh, Thailand and LA. So long story short, got in touch, you know, finally was sort of confronted with a lot of different ingredients and also living in Japan, of course, as you know, Michael, like just the access to fresh, really high quality ingredients there is really, really, you know, unsurpassed. So that was, that was an exciting thing, but it, it just takes time in my experience. Like it takes exposure to food. Some people get that early on, some people get it later. It doesn't really, you know, there's no right or wrong way to do it. And I think that one of the best things I learned in culinary school was actually not to be so precious and to be okay with like making a mistake. You know, we, one of the, one of the problems we have as consumers is, you know, we might go onto New York times and might see this beautiful recipe for like a mushroom pasta or something like that. But, you know, you have like one chance to make it with one recipe with one set of ingredients. And if you screw it up, you feel like a complete failure, don't you? Because like you put all this energy into it. Whereas if you go into any good commercial kitchen, you've got chefs in there experimenting, experimenting all the time and making a lot of mistakes and being okay with it. You know, all right. Yeah. It doesn't taste that great this time. But then if you think about, okay, could I put you know, more acid into this? Could I change the texture? Could I cook this for a different amount of time? After tweaking things just a little bit, you, know, you can end up with something that's really fantastic. And so that, that process of kind of refining and improving, I think that's something that you know, people, people should try to do. And kind of to bring it all the way back to your original <laughs> question, like if you think about Blue Apron, Hello Fresh, uh, Purple Carrot, you know, these meal kit places, um, I think they're great for a lot of people to just try out like some slightly more complex dishes without having to think through every step. And personally, I know when I'm looking at a complex recipe, I'm trying to disentangle process from ingredients. And, you know, if you like if you're just next to a chef and they just say, hey, I got this these carrots, like let's chop them a certain way. That's really easy to get. But when you see that on a page and it's combined with this and this and then you've got to put the oven on at the right time, it can seem a bit overwhelming. And so. I think those meal kits can be, you know, fantastic for, for some people. And, and certainly if you look at, you know, the products that we have, these can fit really well into a meal kit uh, scenario. So, you know, look at these, oh, these are beautiful. Um, this is the micro box and um, you've got some super nice colors here. I'm not good at getting the light, am I? There we go. Yeah. Um, look at something like this. You've got amaranth, which is this beautiful uh, reddish, uh, colored micro amaranth you might have had the grain tiny it's not really a grain but it's a tiny tiny thing that looks like a grain uh, this is the same plant but to get the grain you'll need to grow this thing huge and huge um, got some amaranth in here you got some micro broccoli I don't think you should test me exactly on which one because these look very similar uh, but micro broccoli micro arugula you got a red streak mizuna in there Oh, and one that's really cool. Not that the others aren't. Am I going to find this? I don't want to pull all this out. There is some Lamborn snap peas in here. So Calvin Lamborn was a bit of a legend in the pea industry, invented like the sugar snap pea. Um, refined a bunch of different varieties and stuff. His son, Rod Lamborn, now distributes um, those peas. Sadly, sadly, Calvin passed away, I think, 18 months ago. Or so. But um, those peas are still available, and we work with them to source these really, really beautiful pea shoots. And so in a salad like that, you'll get some sort of slightly more notable things like that. But there's a great mix of micros in there. It's really, really nice and fresh. I realize I'm talking a lot, Michael. You can feel free to chip in. But that is the yellow box. 
And next we have the red box. So in every delivery, right, you get red, yellow, blue. Uh, the red is baby greens. So baby greens are normally grown out a little bit longer, right? So for the micros, you're talking about maybe 17 days to 20 days, depending what it is. The baby greens might be more like 23 to 28 days. It depends. Some of them are faster, like a radish. Uh, for instance, we do have, oh, this is a, a baby rainbow chard. So you'll see the yellow stem. Some of them have more of a red stem. Really, really nice. We've got some Rambo radish in here. We've got wildfire lettuce. We've got Toscano kale. We've got red kale. So you've got a big mix and stuff in there. Oh, you know what? I think I read this wrong. The Lambor peas are in this one. That's why I couldn't find them. Yeah, so this is the Lambourne pea. So what we're trying to do is give you a bit of variety there. So you've got some things that are more crunchy, more flavorful. You've got some things that are softer. Um, I think it's a really, really great little mix of baby greens that you'll, you just are not going to get this in the store. So that is the box. And as a reminder, what happens is you get this in the bag, it comes every week, um, delivery to Brooklyn or Manhattan. Uh, then the next week we come and we pick up your used containers. We give you the new ones. Uh, what we also do in there is we give you a little surprise as well. Uh, I don't have the surprise with me because it's a surprise, uh, but every week you get a different surprise. Uh, it's really, really cool. And that is the end of my QVC uh, home shopping demonstration. But I uh, hope that makes sense. That's our box this week. And so after that, uh, let's talk about Michael, like what's going on in the news this week? I feel like every week now during COVID and now there's more and more and more news about vertical farming. There's funding, there's people opening farms, there's people claiming to have the largest farm in the world. And then the next week, someone else claims to be the biggest company in the world. There's lots and lots of comparing of sizes of farms going on. Uh, but there's also some other interesting trends as well. So what's going on in the news? Yeah, yeah. So um, this week's news, I think we're, we're going to take a slightly different tack and, and maybe have more of a conversation uh, between you and I, because what I, I, I found a couple of articles that I thought were really interesting. And um, so for those of you that don't know, m the majority of my work at Farm One is about building new farms, working with entrepreneurs, farmers and investors to help them get their new farms built. So um, a lot of these topics come up in the conversations that I have uh, with farmers, whether they're existing urban farmers and want to add an indoor uh, facility and operation so that they can grow year round and maybe even diversify uh, their offerings or people that just want to start fresh and, and get into the industry. Um, so this first article I actually found on uh, verticalfarmdaily.com uh, and it was a write-up of an event. This is, this is how event. much news there is now, Michael, by the way. This is how much news there is. There needs to be a daily vertical farm publication. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this sector, as, as we'll talk about, is, uh, is booming in many ways. Um, uh, it, it was a write-up of an event that happened. Uh, so obviously, it's a virtual event now. Um, that uh, uh, was was an event called uh, Asia Pacific Agri Food Innovation Summit, and it was a panel about uh, success factors for scaling vertical farm operations. Reason that I thought this was interesting was that they really highlighted um, a few points and, and kind of narrowed it down. Um, and I, I think it's worth a discussion because, like I said, it's a, a lot of the same types of points that. Uh, we run into ourselves as we're building Farm One uh, as a business, not just in, in New York, but uh, beyond. But also, like I said, a lot of farmers, entrepreneurs and investors that are interested in the sector that we talk about. So the first one was quite interesting. They quoted uh, David Fakwa. Uh, I hope I'm pronouncing his last name correctly, is uh, IGS. I believe they're out in Scotland. Uh, and and they, they have some really interesting solutions as well. Um, but he, he talks about three points here for success factors for scaling operations. The first, obviously, uh, it's all about product, produce quality, right? And the point here being that uh, being able to produce for the local market. And I think you're going to see this as a theme that comes up over and over again. Um, and the second point 
that he talks about is really about the uh, operational aspects um, and the sort of financials that go against it, right? So just as with any business, uh, secondly, the price inputs and outputs need to feed in terms of inputs against cost of production and wholesale prices in the operating region. And thirdly, and I'm really glad that he raised this point, um, be as environmentally clean as possible. Thus focus on having zero emissions once in operation. Um, so let's break it down. First of all, produce quality. Um, more often than not, when I have conversations with people, the thing that really clicks for them, you know, I can talk about uh, the freshness of, of uh, uh, whether it's baby greens or microgreens and the flavor that comes with it. But every time I talk about herbs and those little plastic uh, uh, containers that you get at the supermarket for $3 for a spray yeah. of, of whatever, that's when people sort of begin, that, that clicks for people, right? Because by the time it gets to us, it's horrible. It's tasteless, it's wilted, the whole thing. Yeah. Um, so I'm curious sort of how, when you started Farm One and you started, when, when you really nailed down production and the team really understood how to produce consistently high quality produce, um, what went into that? And, and you know, what was, what was kind of the threshold and the bar that you wanted to meet with that? Yeah, I mean, you know, personally, my, my way into this is all about flavors and ingredients and trying to grow things that I would really want to eat. And actually, you know, the first thing I didn't want to do was just grow boring things. You know, I wasn't really there just to see if I could grow twice as much yield or grow twice as quickly or just make money. I really wanted to make stuff that was very, very tasty. And so, you know, that was my personal uh, angle, but also we started with our first prototype farm inside a culinary school, inside ICE in New York City. So of course we're surrounded by chefs instantly, right? Uh, really good chefs. You know, ICE doesn't employ random people. They employ people who used to run some of the world's best restaurants and have access to, you know, the best equipment and they're, you know, stunning chefs. And so, um, you know, we were placed in that environment straight away. So we think about quality in those terms and we, you know, at our heart, we're, we're that way inclined. We work with chefs, we're across the hallway from chefs. You know, if, if chefs hadn't got excited about our product early on, we just wouldn't have had any traction whatsoever. Now, you know, of course, chefs might be looking for things in different ways than consumers and chefs sometimes are looking for stronger flavors or more sort of striking flavors and that kind of thing. And some consumers really just you know, to be honest, some people genuinely just want something green with no flavor that they can say, okay, I, I gave my kids something green, at least they didn't throw it on the floor or something, you know, and that's fair enough, but we're, we're in a sort of different place where we care about that. And so that's, that's intrinsic in our DNA. Um, and then I think, you know, as we've gone through all of the varieties that we tend to buy, all the seeds that just implants, you know, the things that we test out, they tend to be things that we're trying on with that lens. You know, they have to be really, really flavorful. They have to be striking. They have to be aromatic. Um, and we think about it, yeah, maybe maybe it's a little bit less scientific in some ways than someone else who might be trying to judge like 17 different mm. criteria for how an iceberg lettuce like crunches or something. But we think that that's, you know, the way we're doing it is pretty appropriate. Uh, and we're working with, you know, some of the best uh, palettes. So, so we're pretty confident. Yeah, that's one of the cool things about the history of Farm One, I think, and, and its ties to ice and, and really some of the best chefs in the world, right? At this age, New York City sort of represents amongst the top cities in the world and the pinnacle of, of culinary arts. But it's sort of like, you know, in the, in the auto industry, uh, the development of race cars and Formula One and, and, and all that, the technology that went into developing that, right? I, I think it was like ABS, braking systems and all of that, that eventually found their way into consumer. Uh, products, um, you know, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's kind of how I think about the history of Farm One, right, where uh, we learned how to do this to meet the uh, uh, very particular and, and specific needs of, of, um, of, of that market. And to be able to bring that to consumers, I think is pretty amazing. And this other the second point about price inputs and outputs, how do you then balance that as a 
you know, on the one hand, you kind of think about it as, is that a boutique operation? Is that so, you know, is that sort of uh, what sort of margins are you dealing with there? And if I'm a new farmer, it's, it, it's like, OK, I could go down that path um, versus, you know, this high efficiency, high yield, you know, do regular consumers even care? And um, but it's still a business, right? Yeah, I, I think that, you know, what we encounter and, and obviously you talk to a lot of starter farmers, you know, I talk to a fair number and there's really two ends of this industry, right? There's actually a lot of people in America and, and around the world who are starting by growing microgreens in their garage, in their basement. They're st starting very small businesses that way. They're selling maybe by word of mouth or they're taking them to a small farmer's market and getting a little bit of adoption. And those folks are really keenly aware of some of the granular unit costs of their operation in a way that, you know, some of these larger startups that have raised quite a bit of money are not really as on top of, you know, um, if you ask someone growing microgreens in their basement who doesn't have a lot of money and just wants to actually make money as a hobbyist, you know, they're not going to do it if it's costing them more to, to sow a seed than it, they're going to get in, in, uh, in revenue. So there's that. And then I think that, you know, the other the other part of it is obviously that what everyone's sort of hoping for is gradually with more automation, better technology, that price, that OPEX is going to come down. Um, but, you know, we sort of have always operated um, a little bit closer to that small scale farmer model. We haven't really had loads and loads of cash to play with. We've had admittedly in New York a market that is a big market. There's lots of different sort of comfortableness is what would you say uh, appetite maybe for different price points um and so we've been able to sort of find our niche at that kind of higher end uh, but i think it's absolutely you know he's, he's certainly right david fuck i'd like to say this like you, you if unless you're on top of this stuff either you're going to raise a lot of money and then have a very expensive mistake in a few years time where you realize it's just not stacking up or as a small scale farmer you're just never really going to get off the ground because because of that opex the other thing I think, and we may have said this before, but it's one of the things that people do forget sometimes as individual farmers or small groups, they may discount their own wages as like a, a startup, you know, a little business. They may be like, oh yeah, I'm making money from this. But then if you actually work it back and you figure out your hourly wage, you might be making less than minimum wage or even less, you know? So that's one of the things that, that small farmers have to kind of stay on top of. Yeah, and one of the, interesting things that I end up talking to many farmers about is, um, you know, is, is crop selection. And it's crop selection, not just for the market and, and uh, you know, what, what might meet the palate of, of your local market, but it's also crop selection in terms of uh, optimal use of space. Um, so, you know, you can think of efficiency in a couple of ways. You can think of efficiency in the processes and kind of, you know, uh, uh, how you can uh, drive costs down uh, through scale and things like that. I think that's maybe the most common way of thinking about it. But it's what's also the, the most efficient use of space, right? So you take a small farm that might have, you know, growing area of two, 3,000 square feet, maybe, you know, maybe even 10,000. It's, it's sort of what's the crop selection to, uh, to, to make sure that you're um, growing varieties that might meet the need of the market that might be underserved, but also don't take six months to grow, right? That you can uh, get the highest uh, per dollar square foot yield um, and uh, you know, find the right balance there in terms of A, what to build the brand off of, B, meet a market that's unserved and see sort of you know have that optimal use of space and it's been really interesting kind of watching the the team think through that as as we've been working on this new membership product as well yeah i think that's right you know one of the most disappointing things when you're growing uh sometimes is you find a great variety like there's a there's a variety called dragon's tongue arugula that we grow sometimes it's really nice it's got like a red kind of dot down the middle um it's super nutty it's more flavorful than a regular arugula but 
you know, the seed quality is very variable, we found. Um, the yield isn't super high. The grow time is longer. It's more, you know, susceptible to small fluctuations in pH, that kind of thing. And so, you know, so we can't always grow it and it turns into more of a special thing than an everyday thing. And it's it, that's just one example, you know, of, of, of some of these problems that you might have. And so, um, yeah, it is that blend of like realism and hope. Um, one of the cool things that we've noticed happening, for, for instance, there's a company called Vindara uh, that we've looked at where they're growing uh, seeds or they're, um, they're developing seeds specifically for indoor farming so that they can encourage, you know, traits like flavor uh, that have, you know, somewhat been pushed to one side historically in outdoor farming because people have prioritized things like pest resistance, frost resistance, hardiness of other, other forms or shelf life of the eventual product. And so I think gradually over the next few years, you're gonna see more companies like Vindara pop up. Of course, that seed development pro process is historically quite a long-term process. It's not something where you can develop a new seed within a few months. It's definitely something that takes a few years, but you know, with indoor farming, we can have a faster cycle time uh, as well. So, so I think that um, you know, the hope is that we're gonna have this perfect you know, trifecta of like great yield, great taste, and uh, what's the other one? I don't know, affordability or something like that. So we're gonna be able to have our cake and eat it. But but yeah, it's definitely trade-offs, I think, for a lot of growers. So this third point here on being as environmentally clean as possible, and thus focus on having zero emissions once in operation. So. You know, we've talked about, I think already on the earlier episodes about, uh, you know, some of these claims where, where vertical farming uses 95% less water, 0% land, blah, 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 and all of that. Yeah. I know that sustainability is top of mind. I mean, it comes up virtually every conversation we have uh, at Farm One when either we're planning for something, either we're, we're doing something new or, or, you know, our operations conversations and things like that. Um, could you break down kind of what the key points are here from an environmental sustainability aspect when uh, for, for new farmers? Yeah, I think that, you know, there is a, uh, I mean, I always say this, there's this image that the industry creates that these farms are 100% clean and all this kind of stuff. And I, we just got to cut that out. Um, I think that you know, as a new farmer coming in and trying to do something like this, you know, what you're, what you're really trying to do with vertical farming is to get more consistency. You're trying to minimize water use. Uh, you're trying to minimize things like food miles uh, and avoid having to wash produce and do things like that. Those are the sort of main things that you're gonna get. And so, you know, when it, when it comes to water, like anyone sort of starting in a hydroponic system, unless you're doing something pretty silly, you're instantly gonna be more water efficient really, because you're gonna be keeping that water in the system, it's gonna be contained, you're gonna lose a lot less, you know, from runoff and evaporation and that kind of thing. Um, and then when it comes to, you know, the the other sort of big thing, right, it's power, it's use, it's these lights, right, that we're all sort of relying on in, in vertical farms. And I think that, you know, fundamentally, right, in this country and around the world, the price of electricity right now just does not really capture the environmental impact, you know, the carbon impact of, of what you're consuming. And so as a farmer, you know, it may be tempting to just disregard that. You know, what we do instead is we try to, not try to, we do, we buy renewable energy so that we know that the source of that energy is clean and we're not creating carbon emissions uh, just from running the farm. Um, you know, if you talk to different companies about that, they'll give you different answers. Not a lot of vertical farms are really doing that. Um, I'm surprised because, you know, incrementally the cost of that renewable electricity is not that much different. Um, and I think it's the right thing to do, but you'll get different answers on that. And I think you'll find that people start to be a little bit more cagey about what's going on in their farms and you'll get less honesty. And I think that's, you know, it's a problem. Um, and then the last thing I think that's, you know, really, really uh, uh, overlooked. Um, and I think, you know, if you look at intelligent growth uh, solutions, David Farquhar's company, you know, they're building machines, right? They're building sort of these kinds of racks and they're automated, you've got robotics, all that kind of stuff. Um, and, you know, those systems can be really, really great from a reduction of labor perspective, but of course you're building, you know, more and more infrastructure, you're building metal and plastic and 
uh, rare earth metals and glass and things in LEDs and stuff like that. And so that life cycle is what, how you would describe that environmental impact of that structure. Life cycle analysis, you know, from mining this, these the ore for some of these rare metals to uh, the petroleum products used to create this plastic to the end of life. Um, how do we consider all of those things? And I think that, you know, as this industry matures, we're just going to get better at tracking all that and being able to sort of understand fully what the impact of one of these farms is. Um, and, you know, yeah, exactly. Like, as you're saying, like trying to focus on having zero emissions. But I think that, you know, zero emissions for a lot of companies right now is, you know, a long way away. Um, and so, you know, really it'd be best, I think, as an industry to take at least some steps to put towards like trying to understand what the impact is right now and and to just stop pretending that it's you know by default a perfect system it's not i think that you know one of the most key things about sustainability is stop you know stop pretending something's clean and then we can start to fix it you know but if we all go around pretending that everything's okay then we're never going to fix it yeah yeah the food miles bit is also i think really important because we don't think about that and food miles you know throughout the entire supply chain Right. It's it's one thing to build a slightly or a significantly more efficient giant factory farm that uses you know, 95 percent less water. But if you're yeah. still tapping into an existing supply chain that's extremely dirty, um, uh, you know, that's problematic. Right. And so, yeah. you know, I, I, I think I do think there's a lot of room there for some innovation. Uh, for some new thinking, uh, for for disruption into the supply chain, um, you know, yeah. the, uh, it seems like a lot of what's happening in 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 vertical farming and and in this sort of you know ag tech world is all right. Let's disrupt you know one for a better term big ag and and production um, by simply replacing it with a more efficient form, a more consistent form. Um, but from a sustainability perspective, that's that's a pretty big hole still. You know, if we're still flying stuff yeah. around the world and burning dinosaur juice along the way, you know, it's, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, <laughs> tasty dinosaur juice. Yeah, no, hundred percent agree. I agree. Yeah, yeah. So the next point is um, was by Jessica Naomi Fong of Common Farms. And I, I think it really speaks to product market fit, right? And it's sort of this whole idea of, um, and it also blends into the comment made by Sky Kurtz on the panel from Pure Harvest Smart Farms, where they talk about, um, you know, it's assumed that high quality microgreen grown in New York uh, will also sell in Kuala Lumpur, right? Uh, which might be a huge misconception. There are socioeconomic factors, preferences, uh, consumer education, et cetera. And when you blend that idea with what uh, Jessica Naomi Fong is saying from Common Farms on the panel, that uh, it's not a one size fits all production model. Um, you got to make sure to grow produce that fits the market, uh, the way people eat. And, and But on the commercial side, it's also got to make sense. Um, so, you know, we've joked a couple of times about uh, a conversation we had pretty early on with a, with a potential investor who was really interested in growing jackfruit indoor. Um, you know, it was sort of a bit of a joke for us and all of that. But I, I think it's true, right? It's, it's uh, the two points are really true. It's, it isn't one size fits all. Um, the local market and the local preferences um, make a big difference. And, you know, vertical farming isn't going to be a cure-all for everything at this stage. Um, yeah. But, you know, how do you how do you find that right piece? And it feels like, you know, there's a lot of there, there's two approaches, right? There's there's the plug and play giant factory. You know, we know everybody wants to eat salad, but that's actually not true. Um, but what does the iteration of a vertical farm in you know, Southeast Asia like Singapore? Uh, or Kuala Lumpur sort of look like where, um, you know, the, the, it's a bit of an existential crisis in a country like Singapore to produce its own food. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I've seen it, you know, it comes down to almost this uh, really existential question of like, why do people create companies and why do people try to innovate? Like, what is their actual goal, you know? And so 
Uh, you know, look, if your actual goal is to have a company that is a $10 billion company, you, you don't, I mean, you have some choices, but one of the obvious things to do is to try to plug into the X dozens of billions of dollars a year salad market that already exists and try to disrupt the way that it's produced and try to just slot yourself in. Um, you know, and that requires a certain set of skills, right? It, it requires like some, a team that's operationally like super, super efficient. It requires a team that can do business development with certain other kinds of companies like grocery stores and, and, and kind of folks. And, you know, to be, to be honest, right? Like that is not a set of skills that I, you know, really am that interested in cultivating myself. Like, do I want to be personally in a meeting with, um, Kmart for seven hours and have to fly to wherever Delaware six times a year to do that. You know, it's not, it's not what I want to do. I think it's not what the team that we put together at farm one really wants to do, but it also doesn't, you know, speak so well to, to my skills. And, and so starting a company, you know, uh, th that's a big question, right? If you, if you're a VC looking at a young company, you're trying to see this intersection of like skills, market size, you know, unfair advantage or, or whatever that combination is from a team. You know, and so for Farm One, what we try to put together is, you know, obviously there's a big branding angle. It's about, okay, well, how do we describe this thing and how do we present it to a certain set of customers? And originally that was chefs and now it's consumers. Um, you know, for other companies uh, such as Bowery Plenty or whatever, that may, you know, maybe just a completely different set of uh, ingredients to make that company, I guess. And, and I guess what, you know, what these folks, um, Jessica and Sky and other folks on this panel are sort of trying to say is obviously, you know, don't just build another farm expecting to be able to sell exactly the same product as someone else, you know, because the world just doesn't work that way. You've got to have an angle. You've got to have a reason. And, it, you know, it could be a purely tech angle, like you're 25% more efficient at growing lettuce. And that's all it is. And that may be sufficient to build a great company. But just coming in and using the same equipment as everyone else, you know, the same trotting out the same numbers like, oh, we're 95% more efficient than a field farm. It didn't, you know, it's like, it doesn't cut it. You know, that's table stakes, right? You gotta have a, you gotta have a company that's more interesting at this stage. And, and yeah, absolutely, of course, if you're going into a different market, you might have a different set of, of products, but that's sort of, I mean, it would be absurd not to, to think that, you know? Um, and so, and I, I was thinking, you know, this comment about microgreens grown in New York, it, it sounds like something pretty uh, pointed at us. I'm not sure. But uh, <laughs> but yeah, it's absolutely right. You know, who knows? Who knows? You just got to go into each market and treat it differently. And I think, you know, you, you, you've you been involved in some market entry stuff. If certainly, um, you know, with my previous company, Gengo, in Japan, we were very involved with a lot of people trying to do market entry in Japan. You know, it is a very... Uh, equivalent issue, right? It's like you you would have U.S. companies trying to come to Japan, and they, you know, the first meeting they would have, they would think that they just translate their website, just translate the language, and then publish it in Japan, and then it's all going to just be great, you know. And and it can be further from the truth, you know. Like the sales approach has to be different. You might have to modify the product. There might be competitors on the market who have a better product that you didn't know about in Japan. There may just be a lack of interest, all these kinds of things. And so being, um, you know, you've got to be a big, a good listener and you've got to be understanding and, and just understand like if you're going to go into a new market, for instance, yeah, like, okay, uh, you might have to have a completely different business. Yeah, and on the one hand, you know, it might sound like, well, that's an impossible, you know, you, you've either got this factory farm model where all you're doing is pumping up, pumping out, you know, bags of lettuce or whatever, or you have this highly bespoke approach by market. But, you know, when I think about a business like uh, a McDonald's or, or a Burger King, you know, I grew up in Singapore and the experience of that, you know, obviously had some uh, uh, similarities to McDonald's here in the U.S., but there was uh, quite a bit that was localized, right? And it was localized not just from uh, a marketing perspective. It's very easy just to throw a different language on it. But it was also localized in, in the products as well. So yes, yeah. you had your yeah. Big Mac and your Quarter Pounder and McNuggets and those types of things. But they also devised uh, products that were only available in Singapore. I think there's versions of that in Japan and you name it. Um, yeah. Which, by the way, a filet of fish 
uh, outside of the U.S. is far more delicious than a filet of fish. <laughs> I'll leave that to you to try. Yeah. <laughs> So it is possible, and uh, it's hard to make the argument that uh, McDonald's isn't a giant company. Um, so there was also another point that Sky made uh, from Pure Harvest Smart Farms that was uh, uh, quite interesting. Um, of course, uh, there are three core disciplines when wanting to be part of the CEA sector, uh, serving a market. Designing a construction, so building the farm and designing the farm is something we do quite a bit of. Uh, operating a farm, and then marketing and selling. So one of the things that I tend to run into in the conversations are um, a lot of the farmers that I meet or the entrepreneurs that want to get into this um, are usually one or the other, right? They're usually really good at, at growing things or have a real interest in getting into, you know, what, what color light spectrum should I be using when and that type of thing. Mm -hmm. And then there are people on the business side. I mean, maybe that's just the way uh, um, uh, uh, anything to do with technology, you tend to run into that, right? You've got your engineers and, and your business people or, or, or what have yeah. you. Um, what was that experience like? I mean, you had a lot of experience building a tech company in Kengo in the past and all of that. Uh, how much of that was transferable when, when, when you started working on Farm One? Oh, man. I mean, you know, my certainly my approach is to try to at least have a good working understanding of a technology that I want to use, you know. So, like, for instance, back at Gengo, we were trying to do some things using Go as a new programming language because we wanted to rapidly speed up our API, which had been written in another one, you know. And so it was a, like at that time, it was the kind of thing where, no, I wouldn't really be able to write something great in Go, but I could understand like why we were using it and how would it fit into the rest of our tech stack. And I could have a reasonable conversation about like whether it's worth porting over a huge ton of code into a new programming language that was like relatively unproven and all the pros and cons of that kind of stuff, you know? And so I think with, with Farm One, you know, for me coming in, it was a sort of similar kind of thing where I could design a system and, you know, put together something like this or, or something, you know, version version three or four of that. Um, but like, I'm probably not going to be the best person in a 10 person team to do that, you know? And so that's my approach is to have a, you know, that engineering understanding. Um, and then, you know, for me, like also just, having to be very involved in the marketing and the and the branding and and just the the consumer face of that company is really really important you know um and i think that there's a, a sort of common adage in in silicon valley that you know unless you have a technical founder of a tech company you're gonna run into problems pretty fast like of course you can outsource you know the first app or something but you know very quickly the product is the company and if you don't have someone core to the team part of the founding team part of that vision who's able to continually evolve that you're going to be you know you're going to be in trouble and i think that you know what what sky is partly touching on is that you know as you get more and more of these companies entering the market the question then becomes okay well what what is the company really about you know is is this an engineering company or is this actually um a you know a company that uh, is doing something else, it's marketing, or is it a, a company that's really optimizing operations or doing some aspect of automation? And and that's why, you know, again, I would say, like just building a farm now is, is table stakes. I think you, you have to be able to demonstrate something new and compelling um, that's gonna differentiate you. And then that, you know, again, should be part of the founding team. It should be something intrinsic to the, the crew of folks that you've brought together who wants to do this. Yeah, and there was a final point from Sky, the knowledge and capital barriers to entry are, are very high. I, I'd imagine when you started working on this back, what, late 2015, early mm -hmm. 2016, something yeah. around there. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the, the knowledge barrier was probably much higher, right? Um, particularly around these types of systems, commercial, commercial farming using these types of systems. The systems, I think, I think in our first episode you talked about, or maybe it was in on the uh, Ian Bennett's podcast, you talked about how hydroponics has been around for a while. Yeah. Um, it, it's one thing for the technology to have been around. It's a totally different thing for it to be 
commercialized and and workable in a commercial scale. Um, and it's a totally different thing to take somebody who you know might have built brands and and that in the car industry or or in something else to transfer it to something like this. Um, of course, there are parallels to you know what you would do there, um, but there is a learning curve. There is a learning curve to understand uh, what exists, but also um, uh, uh, the ability to to really invent a lot that's 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 ahead of us as an industry. Um, yeah, I think that's right. I mean, and you know, on the one hand, maybe it was more difficult to start something back in early 2016 but at the same time you know the landscape was much more open uh you know blue ocean kind of thing in terms of that theory whereas now you know market entry uh you know you're just going up against a bunch of different players right and so there's that and then i think you know if you're trying to get hired to be running operations at a larger vertical farm now you know like you're not getting in unless you've got several years of experience and there's not that many people who've managed to get that many years of experience now you've there's like a handful of companies so it's going to be interesting over the next few years to see you know is there going to be more of a career track are, are people going to be able to come into this industry and get up to speed really really fast and and what other industries are going to be interesting for people to come into uh into the vertical farming industry because you know to be honest like four or five years ago when i started thinking about this a lot of folks from the traditional indoor agriculture industry were just super skeptical about vertical farming. They were very dismissive. They, they tended to be kind of older white men who were very just like, you know, this is how it is. You're an idiot kind of stuff. So, you know, it's, it's kind of a new breed now. And I think it's, um, yeah, it's, I mean, it's certainly a, an industry that's going to see a lot of career potential for a lot of people who are interested in that intersection of like engineering operations, uh, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, and this kind of, you know, and, and to Sky's point there, the other thing that's been a barrier to entry is capital. Um, and I'm going to shift over to another article that, uh, that we found, uh, this one in Spoon. Um, and we'll put links to all of this uh, in, in the, on the podcast show notes and also in the comment section of the YouTube, the description of YouTube. But they were uh, reporting on a report that $8.37 billion uh, had been invested in food tech during the first three quarters of 2020. Um, and what's interesting about that is that uh, um, it was uh, ag tech investments of that 8 billion or so uh, represented 3 billion. And that's up from 2.7 billion invested in all of 2019. So in the first three quarters, uh, w the venture industry and other investors had already invested somewhere in the region of 300 million more than they did all of last year. Um, mm -hmm. And food tech investments uh, totaled 8.37 billion, and that's up from 7 billion in all of 2019. So one, it seems like you know there's a bit of a gold rush and and, and all of that that's been happening. We've talked about that, um, but. They quoted um, one of the uh, VC firms, Finestier, that said that the majority of the capital invested in both sectors went to later stage deals, illustrating market maturation. What do you think about that? What do you think? Do you think that's true? Are we out of room for innovation here? Is, is it done? Should we just not bother? I guess maybe I don't know if I should get too hung up on that word maturation. I, I mean, I guess it, it, it's more about the maturation of a few companies that happen to do early deals and are now doing later deals, but they're not necessarily mature companies anyway. So I don't know, maybe 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 we shouldn't get too hung up on that word. I, I, I don't see it as I mean, exactly as you're trying to allude to it, this, this sector isn't kind of over. I think it's just the beginning and you're just going to see more and more and more, you know, higher resolution opportunities in in the space so like uh i don't know if you broke down those deals like what the proportion would be like vertical farming versus field farming drones analytics other you know other kind of stuff but but vertical farming would be a nice little chunk in there i think uh but yeah what you've seen the larger deals to date in vertical farming have been people who want to build really big farms and need to raise a ton of cash to do that 
And I think what you're going to see is more interesting deals happening in the next three, four, five years, where it's technology companies that have a specific offering that are going to be plugging into these vertical farms or enabling other people to build those kinds of things. I think that's going to be interesting. Um, it's going to be interesting partly because the, you know, the profile, the balance sheet, those kind of companies is just completely different to people who want to operate massive vertical farms. So for VCs, I would say it's probably you know a more interesting opportunity long term. Maybe we'll see. We'll see. Um, and yeah, I think that, you know, you're just going to see a lot more. I mean, uh, I don't know if you looked at like series A rounds of ag tech companies this year versus last year, I would expect there would be more just as alongside that increase, you know, in, uh, in deal numbers, uh, which would only mean that in three or four years time, you're going to see more and more, you know, series B, series C kind of stuff. I'd have to dive into numbers a little bit more to be more intelligent than that. But I think that definitely, you know, this is not like a mature market. It's still very much at the beginning. Um, and, and the growth of some of these companies involved is going to enable more and more innovation because if, and it's an if, if Plenty succeeds or if Bowery succeeds or if Aerofarm succeeds, those companies will, of course, be natural acquirers of earlier stage companies with technology and all that kind of stuff. So you'll see a beneficial cycle, but it'll take a, a while for that to to happen, I think. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a really good point. I think, you know, that's through the eyes of, of that type of investor, right? So they broke it down in the report that the areas of investment that, that where most of the money had gone into is indoor food production. Uh, so Bright Farms Plenty, you know, raising more than a million plus uh, this year. Um, food delivery, which is also quite interesting. Um, your, uh, you know, Grub Market and all of those guys. And we've, we've seen that emerge, I think, out of COVID uh, in, in a really interesting way. And of course, there's some downside to it. Restaurants aren't too fond of that because of the types of fees and that type of thing. Um, but, you know, more competition, the better there. Um, Plant-based foods, which we talked about a lot uh, last, uh, last episode, um, but also, I guess maybe tied to that or, or um, some kind of the, the lab lab grown meats and lab grown foods. I think there's probably a fair amount of innovation and runway there. Sure, uh, yeah, definitely. That, that, that we could see. And then grocery as well as uh, going to change. I mean, the retail environment is completely different. I mean, it, it, it's been a long, slow death, it seems like, for a long time now <laughs> <laughs> that we've been reading about. But COVID might have finally uh, uh, sort of stuck the knife through the yeah, heart and I, twisted it. I, I'm really curious to see what happens with grocery retail, you know, uh, in cities, out of cities, all that kind of stuff. I, I think that, you know, obviously, as consumers, our relationship to physical places has just changed dramatically in 2020. I think that if you talk to a lot of people, they want to go back to where they were. They want to be able to go to a restaurant. Obviously, they want to be able to hang out with people They, you know, I think some people are probably sick of the waste of like home food delivery and all that kind of stuff. So I, I'm really curious to see what happened. Um, I mean, we were talking to some real estate folks on Friday. Uh, it's clear that, you know, retail um, price per square foot in Manhattan has obviously dropped and people are getting access to shorter leases now. There'll be much more experimentation next year, I think, pop ups, that kind of stuff. And so I think there'll be some space for some, you know, some of the larger brands like Amazon, obviously, to do some experimentation. They've been doing that already, but they'll have some space to do that. But also there'll be space for new entrants. And I think there'll be space for some people, you know, for instance, we've talked about the Wally shop, for instance, the zero uh, waste. Uh, reusable packaging company. There's other packaging free shops, all that kind of stuff. So just in that sort of niche of sustainability, I, you can imagine a couple of those folks doing pop up retail in Manhattan uh, or you know similar sort of markets around the country and being able to do it at a cost that is actually pretty interesting to them and tying that sort of online offline together um, in a way that obviously they're going to be more agile about experimenting with that than a larger company. And so I, I think you'll see some interesting new grocery kind of stuff happening. Uh, but I hope it's from startups and not just, you know, Kroger's doing like a thing. It'll be something that, that's more interesting. I think there's opportunity there. And I think consumers would be excited about it if it is, you know, it's got to be super cool, right? But like, you know, there'll be, there'll be some excitement there. Yeah. And I think that with this new sort of 
trend maybe I, I think it's maybe a bit more than a trend with direct to consumer right where you know every time i go on instagram i just get flooded with ads from either Jeez. somebody trying to sell me yeah. shoes or jeans that they're making <laughs> and, you know yeah. it's it's sort of high fashion and high quality but it's 50 percent less than you know what you'd get um, my favorite you know, one I, by the way i gotta say my favorite one that gabby my girlfriend sends me every few months <clears throat> is a it's a it's an ad where a guy uh he looks like a college kid He's by a pool. He's got a regular beach towel and he's got this one that he's trying to sell. And he says, beach towels are shit. And he throws the beach towel into the pool, which of course we all do all the time, right? <laughs> Never do that. And then he pulls it out and he's like, oh, look, it's all wet. And then he shows, throws the other one in and the other one doesn't get wet. And he uses that as some kind of selling point. And it's like, what world are we in? This is sort of like the worst infomercial I've ever seen. Um, but, you know, these guys are doing it on Instagram and probably making a fair amount of money because people purchasing and, they, they, you know, they're, they're convincing themselves that beach towels are shit. But like, yeah, I agree with you. There's, a, there's so much of this right now. Um, anyway, carry on. I just had to share that because it's so ridiculous. Oh, uh, note to self, get Rob beach towel for Christmas. <laughs> um, yeah, and I was just sort of, it really makes me think about what that world looks like, because if it used to be really convenient and maybe just out of necessity, right? Or I, I don't know which came first, but you'd go to a department store or, or you go to a grocery store, you get all of your shopping done, right? And then there's this other idea that, well, you know, if all of a sudden I'm going to the uh, to, to the farm one to get my greens and then I'm going to the butcher to get my meat and, and, and all of that, it's it's just so less it, it's it's much less convenient for me now. Right. Um, but I think that problem has been solved, too, because, you know, the convenience of ordering, I mean, you, you don't have to leave home and all of that. So maybe it kind of nets out. And if everybody's delivering or there's a central delivery service, you know, that's where they're aggregating all of your suppliers and your and, and, and you know, your your local needs, maybe that changes the game. Um, and then what does that retail sort of need look and feel like? We've talked a lot about, you know, events, tours and classes being a really big part of what we're about. You know, what what does that expression look like? You know, when, when we're out yeah. of it, I, I think is really interesting. Yeah, I mean, it speaks to competition for attention, right? And, you know, historically, if you wanted to get access to customers, you had to re you had to build retail and you would build retail, you know, in the 80s, you would do it in a mall, right? And now now that seems like a crazy idea, right? But, you know, the other thing that's happening, of course, now is if you think about this in a different industry, you look at Netflix, Amazon, Hulu, HBO Max, etc. You know, they are now getting to the point where you know, a few years ago, you'd have your Netflix subscription and maybe you'd have your cable bundle and then people started to unbundle from cable. But then they start to get in the same situation now where they've got Hulu and HBO Max and all these other ones. And you, you're back in this world that we didn't want to be in several years ago where you're paying all these people different amounts of money for, you know, sometimes even overlapping content on the on the on the platforms. And so I think, you know, there's this there's always this wave right of consolidation and then opening up of the market and then consolidation again. And I think that, um, you know, certainly in the food space, like, yeah, I guess, you know, it is a little bit new for folks like us to try to go directly to consumer. But, you know, of course, we have the channel to do that. We have the Internet, we have social media, we have other angles. And I think for us, of course, you know, there's also the potential to use our locations as retail spaces and all, all that kind of stuff. So. So, yeah, I, I mean, it, I think it's only good for, you know, it, it's good for small producers just as Amazon encroaches further and further into every part of our life, it's also easier and easier for someone to do a little pop-up store on Instagram and, you know, make some money and sell beach towels, you know? So there's, there's, there's a good sort of healthy um, kind of mix going on. And, and I think, you know, post COVID that will continue and we'll just see, we will see more innovation, which is great. Wrap all of that up and, 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 you know, bring an end to all of this so what do you think so we work with independent farmers right so one of the things that we talk a lot about is um our our vision uh not just on what we're building in tribeca and in new york city and farm one locations uh, elsewhere but you know in, in, in a way we see ourselves as the champions of, of independent farmers 
um, you know, if you're familiar with the tech industry, you know, we, we sort of drew a lot of inspiration from the WordPress model, for example, where, you know, instead of going after, you know, if you're in the content management space, you know, being the Adobe with their system and being this large enterprise system that's, you know, worth whatever it is Adobe's worth, um, you know, we're, we've drawn a lot of inspiration from WordPress and what they've done for independent publishers and, um, you know, and, and really putting uh, web publishing into the hands of, of, you know, millions of people. I think they claim something like 30 or 40% of all websites are run on WordPress right now. So, you know, if we sort of see this vision of independent farmers and, you know, everything that we've done and that we've built to operate farm one and, and making that available to them all the way from designing your, your farm and, and your crop selection to operating your farm to the sales and marketing side of it. Um, you know, with with all that that we've talked about uh, on this on this podcast, what do you think the opportunities are for independent farmers, um, and yeah, you know, and and maybe small scale or, or even local operations? Yeah, I think there's a lot of opportunities, and I think that you know it speaks to this um, this sort of trend and counter trend that we've had, you know, certainly in the US, but in other countries as well, where consumers have been kind of separated from their food by automation, larger scale farms, food being shipped in. And, and obviously fa farmers markets are an attempt to kind of push back against that. Uh, but of course, farmers markets are limited, you know, by seasons and by weather and all that kind of stuff. And so, you know, growing indoors, growing in a vertical farm now is an opportunity again for a small farmer who wants to serve their community primarily to be able to build something, to build build it, you know, with a little bit of money, but not that much money and not, you know, you don't need a PhD to, to run a vertical farm on a small scale to do that and then to offer food to, to their local consumers um, and, and establish themselves, you know, it'd be too sort of grandiose to call it a brand, but if you're um, someone who's growing food in a clean way in your garage and it tastes really, really good and you're reliable and they know that you're going to turn up every time at the farmer's market and deliver them something nice and you, you're a nice person, like that's a brand, you know, and that's a brand that's much more approachable than, you know, buying something off the shelf that was grown in Arizona and then shipped across country. And you have no idea how it was grown. And so I think that's this huge opportunity for us to go a little bit back like back to our roots or maybe those roots were never there you know um it's like it's like that well i won't get too political about it but like anyway so like that 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 is an opportunity and then i think you know the other piece of it of course is the price of this equipment is always going down it's like the early days of the internet right if you wanted to host a website in 1994 you would have to install your own server that was physically located in your bedroom and you would have to plug it in and figure out all of the protocols and everything and then a few years later you know people started to have tools like wordpress that would allow people to get up and running and get up and running in a way that was flexible but also gave them a lot of scalability as well and so i think we're going to see those kinds of technologies just improve and make it easier and easier for small farmers um, and I think that's just so important because we've got to have a countervailing force to the factoryization of all of our agriculture. You know, I think there's a place for large scale and there's a place for efficiency, but there has to be also smaller farmers doing interesting things, supporting their community, being human, being approachable, um, and not trying to have some, everything swallowed up by kind of big ag. And so I'm really excited about that. I think, you know, we have a vision that we can help quite a lot of these people do that. Um, you know, definitely going back to the point about not every market wanting every, you know, exactly the same kind of product. Uh, we can also help people do that and tailor that. Um, and I think it's going to be super exciting because I think you're going to see more companies sort of involved in that tech stack for those people. You're going to see more companies just focusing on specific parts of it, like marketing or seed development or, you know, operations. And so it, this is going to be a really exciting in ecosystem. Um, I don't think a lot of people see that yet. I think a lot of people focus on big names, big funding, big farms, but there's this huge potential for a much more interesting, diverse, large, thriving ecosystem of smaller farmers that help each other and tap into a large network. Um, and I think that can grow really good food, really, really good, tasty food that's interesting. It's super local, um, it's fresh, it's safe, clean, all of that stuff. 
Yeah, and if we learned nothing from COVID, and hopefully we did learn <laughs> a lot from, from COVID, um, it's the importance of a resilient supply chain. And yes, resilient supply chain is made up of a couple of things, right? One, it's not a dependence on, you know, one source, because uh, we saw what happens when that breaks down. Um, and the second was, you know, how close to the source can you get when the one thing that, that, that supplies you uh, can no longer do that and shut you down, right? So um, I, I, I think it is an existential thing. I think, you know, the, there's a humanity side of it and the human experience side of it. Obviously, I'm a big fan of that and, you know, discovery of new flavors, ingredients and, and, and also opportunities, economic opportunities for people. Um, but it, 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 I, I think it's a real existential threat that we saw. And you know, if whether you whether you see this happening again in terms of a global pandemic or, or other things, I mean, there's multiple threats that are ahead of us. Um, and if we don't change that, and if we don't find the opportunity to do that, I think we're we're in a bit of trouble. So, um, good thing is it was a great opportunity. Hopefully, uh, some of the the things that we talked about will uh, help people think in terms of, um, you know, what it takes to build a farm, how they should think about their business, how they should think about their teams, um, and the the opportunity that lies ahead in, in this industry and, and what we can learn from operations like ours and others. Yeah, um, no, absolutely. Sounds good. Um, how are we doing on time, Michael? I think we might have to even wrap it up like very, very shortly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, I, I think we uh, we can wrap it up. Uh, the okay. one thing I would say is, um, you know, anyone out there, uh, if you have any questions or uh, even questions that you want us to address on future podcasts, uh, feel free to shoot us a note on. You know, we're on all the social channels, um, or even shoot us a note on uh, email info at farm one. Sure. Yeah, you're going to see a little thing oh, on the bottom of the screen here. But anyway, yeah, exactly as Michael said, we're on social uh, farm.1 on Instagram and then farm.1 spelled out on Twitter and on Facebook as well. Yeah, but we love uh, working with farmers. We love teaching people, you know, what they might expect from building a farm, helping them come up with a vision, all that kind of stuff. Um, so, yeah, we're going to wrap it up. Thanks for listening to us. Thanks for watching us today. Um, next week, we're going to be back with um, a little bit more regular crew, crew of folks. Um, and, you know, as we go through over the next few weeks or so, we're also going to feature some longer interviews with people outside the team as well. So you won't just have to listen to us, even though it's amazing. Um, and, you know, yeah, we're going to explore different parts of the industry, sustainability, urban farming, communities, uh, all kinds of interesting stuff. So thanks for hanging with us today. Um, please eat some fresh and healthy and great food tonight. Um, and we'll catch you next time uh, on the Farm One podcast. Bye.